maybe we could start this off just so people can put uh, names to sounds of people's voices. Could we just uh, start and just give a quick introduction? Uh, why don't we start with Mason, since you just joined? Uh, let, just let us know a little bit about your background and your uh, compositional work. Sure, yeah. So my name's Mason. Um, I'm a composer, vocalist, and multimedia artist. I'm from Sugarland, Texas, and I'm currently based in Boston. Um, and as a composer, I'm really emphatic about bringing genres together and like sound preferences together, sound design, other types of techniques together in order to create immersive listening experiences. Um, and as a composer, I got my career going, I guess, with school. I got my undergrad and um, I got a Bachelor of Music and Composition from the University of North Texas, which is outside of Dallas. And then I got my master's, Daniel went too. I got my master's uh, in composition from the Boston Conservatory at Berkeley. And outside of my practices as a composer, I'm also a career services advisor at the Berkeley Career Center, just helping equip musicians with business skills and job opportunities and stuff like that. Wow, what a what a cool background and set of set of activities. It's great, uh, Danny uh, Mason. Just give you a quick mini introduction. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh my goodness, yeah, it is great to be in here with you all. And I'm sorry if it looks like I'm looking around a lot. I'm actually going to be coaching a soccer session in about 30 minutes or something. So a lot of kids are walking by and being like, "Hey, Coach Danny," and things like that. But to make a long story short, um. I'm from Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, I definitely started my studies with uh, Lauren Pierce, who passed me on to Craig Butterfield right over in here. So it's really amazing to be in a com in a composition circle as him to really come full circle. Um, my grand teacher, technically grand teacher, was um, Jeff Bradichich at UNT, which is how I ended up out there and studying alongside Mason. And we got to collaborate on plenty of cool activities. I definitely was more of a performance major and liked to bounce around a lot thanks to a lot of influences. And now that I'm kind of tapping into the music that's more or less in my soul and coming out with it, it is leading me in a lot more of an expression that I feel um, isn't quite as out there as other works. I would say um, I bounce around a lot of more rhythmical and jarring motifs that would reflect the psyche of like black American feelings that can stem from being someone like me that studies a lot of different genres within the realm of classical music. I mean, within the frame of classical music, as well as um, the fact that I play a lot of other instruments and just have a lot of other influences outside of music that in, that really inform the things that I write to this day. So I'm still a really big like beginner when it comes to composition, but I, I'm just putting in that work and seeing what I can latch on to. So I appreciate you guys having me here. Uh, it's wonderful. And what a small world. It's like everybody on this call <laughs> <laughs> as a tie tied together I just, Craig you you just came up so uh, I want to uh, introduce yourself Craig sure um Craig Butterfield I'm the base professor at the University of South Carolina I've been here this is my 17th year of teaching um I also went to University of North Texas and studied with Jeff Bradetich um while I was there I also got a chance to study with Lynn Seaton which was which was great um compositionally I kind of came to the game really late I suppose I mean, I mean when I was a kid I always kind of wrote music but then there's a sort of like no one ever said this, but there's a sort of implicit thing sometimes when you get to music school that's like you're you, you get put in a track, right? I mean, your your theory or your history or your performance or your education or your composition, um, which is you know I think an artificial separation. Uh, but I I kind of bought into that a little bit, and so I just kind of put my head down. I was like, okay, I'm gonna like learn study and learn how to play the bass. Um, and it wasn't until you know pretty recently, maybe uh, seven or eight years ago, when I started kind of figuring out, you know, different ensembles that I was playing in and, okay, well, there's no music for this ensemble. So, you know, we got to, you know, I just kind of came into it, I guess, you know, from practicality of trying to uh, fill um, uh, music for groups I was playing in. And I, you know, kind of my main musical partner is, um, is a guy named Jesse Jones, who's um, professor of composition at Oberlin and a multi-instrumentalist plays banjo, mandolin, guitar, and, and a wonderful pianist. And he kind of, 
uh, mentored me a little bit and and kind of showed me, hey, you know, you you know, have some ideas here. You can you know flush these out in this way, in this way, and and um, so in all the the music I play with him, uh, you know, I kind of co-write all the music in collaboration with him, um, which is a really interesting experience and, and very humbling because this you know that's what he does <laughs> for a living. So um, uh, yeah, but that's that's kind of my background and and how I came into uh, composing a little bit for the bass. Uh, very cool. Uh, Donovan, Donovan Stokes, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, yeah, so I'm Donovan Stokes, and I uh, teach at Shenandoah University, and I've been here, I don't know, I think 15 years. Um, and I studied, I mean, studied with a couple people on bass, but probably the two uh, most recognizable names would be Edgar Meyer and Lawrence Hurst. Um, and then, you know, I was composing, you know, before I played, actually before I played upright bass, but uh, in, all through college, I got performance degrees, but I uh, minored every time uh, also as a composition major. I started out as a double major, but that didn't, didn't suit me. Um, so uh, I had the guy named Joe Nelson in Texas and Mary Jean Van Appledorn in Texas. And then in uh, Nashville was Michael Curick and Michael Ro Alec Rose. Um, and those are sort of like my main compositional teachers. And uh, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm <laughs> – I what am I doing as a composer is a good question. I don't know. Like I'm always trying to experiment with new things. Seems to be a certain sound that keeps coming out, but I'm not so deliberate about it. Uh, if that makes sense. Like I'm not trying to do a specific thing compositionally. I'm trying uh, to just explore new, new timbres and new ideas. And I, I, I like to draw a lot from uh, well, obviously heavy metal, but also gypsy music and things like that. Yeah. And Donovan was one of my original podcast guests. I think the first time you were on my show is 14 years ago at this point, which is it, in, yeah, it was, insane. <laughs> it was back when we still had landlines on the phone, I think. Yeah, things have evolved. I was thinking back to that. I used to, uh, then I'll introduce Sam, but I was thinking about, I, that was back in the day when I used this weird recorder where I would drift apart from my guest. So my guest would get ahead of me, I think. So I would, they would, uh, I would start laughing like a weirdo while they're talking and they would tell a joke and it would be dead silence and as you know things have evolved a lot so it's great to be able to have this kind of video call and and that sort of thing and uh sam sam suggs uh tell us a little bit about your uh background hi everyone um my name is sam and um i teach over just down the road from donovan at uh james madison university i've been here for five years <clears throat> um you know, I kind of grew up in uh, playing a lot of jazz, where there's less boundaries between uh, the composer and the performer, um, that there's kind of just a, a spirit of creation, like in the music making. Um, and I'd say, you know, I, I studied, I didn't really ever follow that path of like, you know, I'm going to be the performer path. And I actually did like a, I started a chemistry degree and ended up with a music theory degree for my undergrad. Um, and, you know, now I teach bass primarily, but um, I feel like, you know, the double bass is such a wonderful vehicle um, because it's largely unknown what its capabilities are. Um, and so um, a lot of my composing is like centered around kind of trying to um, create things in performance, you know, that, that are, aren't like creating pieces which are a vehicle for performance. Um, and having that kind of tactile um, experience with the instrument allows there to be um, maybe like a, a special relationship with the music that we're writing. Um, and it's, it's interesting too to like, you know, some of my favorite bass composers are here, bassist composers are here, and it's, it's great to, um, you know, just be part of this conversation about how do we write music, um, new music for the bass that is like interesting and captivating, but um, also like for a wide range of student, so that not everyone's stuck playing Vivaldi, <laughs> uh, which I love Vivaldi, but um, yeah, 
Yeah, well, this has been such an interesting project uh, on my end to see. Like, like I have enjoyed following along with all of your music, and uh, and it is it was so cool to see what would you all do with given some parameters of like we're writing for somebody that's relatively new to bass, not brand new, but you know, they get, and 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 I just love how your personality and your compositional styles have c came out, and it and it's been fun for me to get to introduce these people pieces to people because they're pieces nobody's heard so i have a couple students come over and i say check this out check this out and maybe i could start with danny because it looks like he's just about to start coaching <laughs> but but danny so he, he wrote a piece called you or you wrote a piece called morning stretch and that has remained in my practice sequence daily and i do it right after i get done with scales and it's such a really cool and just peaceful and meditative piece and throwing in some low thumb position and some pizzicato and it's just really beautiful what did, did let us know what, what you were thinking about when you're writing that piece or how did you write it or just any thoughts about that piece i appreciate that and i'm glad i'm glad that it's in it's in the, some warm-up repertoire as well i like to get around it when i can i would say that um when it's come to how i've approached how can i help kind of a beginner or intermediate basis i've thought of how in in my upbringing, we had a lot of uh, really preconceived notions of how our hand shapes needed to be. And plenty of those are definitely good work. And I feel as though, as I got older, especially into the advanced, uh, into my more advanced stages with uh, undergrad and graduate school at Carnegie Mellon, I was doing a lot of experimenting, especially because of, um, especially because of Craig as well. He, he would always be doing a lot of projects where I would notice his thumb would be getting thrown back in very low positions and things of that nature. And all of a sudden, between seeing him and Jeff and plenty of other students around, I was just like, you know, just how low can my, can I take this thing before it gets crazy? And uh, I would begin to work on a lot of different interval shapes that would involve me like throwing my thumb all the way back. All of a sudden I'm working on Mozart 35, trying to do that first scales, putting like a thumb on E and making it work to, you know, go up the string and put, and um, really keep it all in one position and things of that nature. But I felt as though I, there's always gonna be like a fear or, an inner kind of resignation towards going to thumb position at first because you're like oh man i'm over here playing this whale of an instrument and all of a sudden they want me to sound beautiful all the way up there and i'm just i was just feeling as though as i wrote the piece that there's a way that i could kind of introduce and allow younger players to or just lesser experienced players to just dip their toes in the water and at the end of the day the parts of your hand and the shapes that you make you have to, I just feel like you have to feel as though the bass is an extension of yourself and of your body as a whole. And if any of that feels foreign to you, whether that's fingering or shapes or scales and things of that nature, that it should be worked out ahead of time as much as you can to just take. So through morning stretch, I like for the basis to think about how can you meditate with the instrument and take it slow and just really get used to forming those shapes low in a way that's safe because it's also very easy when you're playing the bass to you know cause an unnecessary injury by stressing too hard so i felt that with a slower and more just relaxed piece that that bass players at their own pace could really experiment with um just that type of really stretched hand shape and how it is to contract and expand across the strings as well as have a good time with um, learning the resonances around the lower and upper positions. It's a beautiful piece, and you brought up the word meditative, which I really feel that it has this sort of peaceful quality to it, and all the different parts. And it's been fun to stretch the tempo. And I love how the I, the word stretch seems to have many uh, levels of meaning in this piece, both like just in terms of like what you can do with your hand and with low thumb position, but also tempo wise. I was finding that and just really beautiful, beautiful piece. I just can't wait to play more of your music. I I can't wait to see what you do as you're on this journey. And speaking of meditative. Uh, Mason's piece, Music for Meditation, I, I was, both Jeff Chalmers and I were so surprised when we got, and it's, I was, was just so thrilled with what you wrote. Mason wrote this beautiful piece uh, uh, that in, with a vocal backing track and and the nature sounds in the background, and I have, I have had so much fun working on that, and I had this funny memory of working on it because I was practicing it with my AirPods Pro, which would constantly D, D, 
uh, pair with my iPad. So I would start off practicing music for meditation by yelling at my iPad, which is like not the right spirit. But I, I finally started, uh, <laughs> I finally started uh, practicing with proper headphones and just a lovely piece. And t- just tell us about your thing. And, and basically, I think I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember Sue Wolf, a wonderful bassist in San Diego, playing this other piece of yours that uses a lot of percussive and vocal effects. Am I right? Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So with that piece, um, I was with a group called Bass Players for Black Composers. Um, and then uh, Danny was also a part of that group. And it was called The Reckoning. And I wrote it in 2020 to suggest all of the reckonings that we were having. Um, and yeah, thanks, y'all, for the notes and the chat. Uh, yeah, I love that piece. It was very percussive. It's, I feel like, very expressive of my sound as far as bringing genres together, different idioms together, but then also in, like encouraging the bassist to just give more of themselves. When I gave, I approached Danny to be a part of the project and um, I asked him to add his own element and like a second iteration of that line. And he added beatboxing and that piece has just taken off. And uh, currently Robert Black from being on a can is going to be performing it on his uh Friday, I forget what he calls his program, but um, Fridays with Robert Buck, I think so. Anyways, yeah, that's that one. And then with music for meditation, when you approach for this project, at first, I wanted to make sure that I wrote something that was idiomatic to beginner adults. I didn't know how much we were stretching that word like beginner, you know, so I wanted to at least add an element that um, really heightened or like elevated the overall performance experience. Um, But then also, I had never really been able to engage my voice that way. I'm also a vocalist. I was classically trained and I did opera and jazz and early music. And I just wanted to bring that element to it. And then I'm also about all about immersive listening experiences. So I wanted to bring in those bird sounds so that it was this meditative piece where it was me and the bassist together each time being able to do that. So really excited about that project. It's just such a great, and I just love how all these, again, all these different approaches. I'm just thinking about the person who's, who's going through and playing music by contemporary composers we're all sitting here on this call and like like what a cool experience these nice wonderful long tones it gives people a chance to think about sinking in and pulling in good sound which they would be doing anyway but then to add the element of your vocal harmonies and and just sort of understand oh how can i just can't wait to explore that with students that what what you write just a fabulous fabulous piece and i i hope you do it's so cool the those two pieces you just spoke about how different those two pieces are i can't wait to see how you continue to explore those kind of directions and what else you do just really really exciting i just i love your music so much but uh, all of your music but it's really was it has been so much fun to work on that Oh, well, thank you so much. And I have really been digging the bass lately. Like weirdly, I've been getting these commissions to be writing for bass. And um, Daniel was so gracious during our undergrad to be able to partner together on pieces for bass. So um, I'm trying to figure out, but like the reckoning and the music for meditation are two different extremes. So I feel like I need one more to figure out where to get in the middle of that pocket. So thank you so much for your hard work on that. Well, thank you, and I look forward to see what, where where you go with that. And 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 so I, maybe I'll go to Sam next because maybe you just I, I, you took me back to chatting with Sam for the podcast. Maybe 2016. It seems like it was just yesterday, but I think it was like five years ago at this point. And Sam, when I first discovered Sam's bass playing and composition, I he's one of these people. You're one of those people, uh, Sam. That really made me think like how how I I didn't even realize it was possible. What you were doing on the bass sometimes and I thought like I have the same hands I have the same harmonics why have I never even thought of this and you you sort of you Sam you you were you were talking to me back in that conversation about the use of harmonics on the bass and just how interesting it is and part of it is because of the register of the bass harmonics for on violin or viola they're just so high that the harmonic possibilities are not quite there and so I just and and the the approach that Sam took and and the Sam I'll, I'll shut up in a second and you can elaborate but his piece droplet stayed entirely at the neck block i think with one exception you went down to like a c on the g string but the student is right at the neck block playing a combination of harmonics and closed notes and and what you can do in the neck block is incredible Uh, so just talk about that or your idea behind the piece or or whatever you like sam (laughs) thank you jason um this is this is fun uh it's great to check out all these other pieces as well um 
Yeah, so Droplet, I think you guys asked me to write a piece that was just in, was it third position? Um, and I was like, okay, this is cool because it really gives you a limited palette. Um, and, you know, creativity always comes with constraint. Um, and so the, it, was, it was really fun to write. Um, and yeah, I, I, I feel like, you know, I, I incorporate a lot of harmonics into it because not only are they kind of... Um, you know railings to hold on to when you're when you're playing the instrument it really like it's the physical reality of the bass these these posts to hold on to um, but it also kind of invites a lot of um, exploration right because there are there's like you know there's the ground level and then there's the harmonic level and you know that you're exploring the kind of three dimensions of of the the bass in that area um, and the piece droplet you know I just I, I like to warm up with kind of like you know I put on a drone and and play around that drone and when I started this I was just kind of doing that and then I got to the idea of oh you know I want that a to be pure like where that harmonic is so I have it closed and then I release and it kind of makes this dripping sound um, just like a little type thing and um, so you know the piece kind of came from thinking about how could I incorporate this in a creative way where it's it's an effect at first and then it becomes part of um, kind of the more melodic element um, so there's it's kind of a piece in two parts um, really an exploration of kind of like this almost improvisatory speech-like thing interrupted by the droplets and then kind of a little bit of a groove that uses um, the harmonics almost like um, I remember when I was a kid I had a Yamaha keyboard and it, you could like press start and it would play like a drum groove or something but there was a way to change channel 10 to from like a drum set to like a piano so it would sound like boom beep boop boop beep boop doo, beep boop beep boop boop you know this kind of funny stuff so um in a weird way like the b section of this piece is just like a little bit more drum setty in terms of using the harmonics as kind of like the hi-hat or something um so yeah the piece just kind of evolved from improvisation and um you know wanting to allow the performer to like or the student or everyone <laughs> to um just feel super free with the timing and try to make it like speech speech like at the beginning um but then have a little bit of fun with left hand pizzicato um and kind of navigating the space that that vertical space between the closed notes the solid notes and the harmonics it was just such an interesting study in miniature. It's almost like a Webern, and not 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 at all in harmonically, but it was just in terms of like a, it's on one page, and there's so much there. And I could and I remember t Sam talking to you about how how you think about structuring so many things like a suite, like when you're putting together a recital, you think of that. And I, I had that in mind. Just you, you can feel the different sections, and in just a few bars, and in just one region of the bass, it's just incredible what you can explore and timbrely. And your Sam, yours was the first piece. That that, that came in and, and just on my end, it was so much fun. Open up my email. I usually hate checking my email, but I had fun when I opened up and there was a Jeff Chalmers sent me a message saying, here's the, here's this new piece. And then the, and so it was so great to dig into that. And then Craig, your piece was the next one. And, and at first I looked, I was like, uh Oh, is this going to be too hard? And then I realized, no, it's not. It's a, it's like a brilliant introduction to the major harmonic positions on the bass. And it's one of, I, I've had so much fun playing that. Like when I when I uh, demo a bass these days or try something out, it, the kind of like the boom, boom, beam, boom, 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 beam, the main theme on that. That's like the thing I've been playing. Or when I put on new strings, I've actually got a YouTube video coming out where I'm demoing Zyx and Kaplan strings with that theme. So, um, and, and one of the, we Sam brought it up, but we had we had we wanted everybody to write like they write right in their style but because it was with beginners in mind and because I was teaching with the Raboth positions in mind predominantly I mentioned you know this is what we're teaching you do you but but if you want to incorporate something and Craig you just so elegantly in decades end uh, explored those positions and in such a it's such a cool way so just 
talk about that, your approach to that piece or the piece or whatever you like. Sure. Um, well, that's, that's, that's very kind. And I, I <laughs> kind of wish I, I could say it was totally intentional, but um, it, I didn't necessarily sit down and, and think, okay, what is, you know, what's the Roboth position and how do I write something in that? I mean, it, but I think that, you know, the, the great thing about the Roboth positions is, is that they're sort of rooted in like a physical reality of the instrument, right? I mean, we've got these harmonic nodes and they make really great um, anchor points. I think like rails, like Sam was saying. And um, in fact, kind of for going back for years, I've been listening to like Sam's uh, recordings and like, you know, Nick Walker's compositions too, that really seamlessly blend, you know, mixture of stop notes and harmonics in positions. And I've been experimenting a lot with, um, you know, chord, uh, different chord structures we can play with like a low stop note with all the harmonics that are under our hand. Um, and so I, I guess I tend to think a lot just in those sort of natural positions, you know, cause those are where the harmonics are under our hand. Um, but um, yeah, I think, you know, with that tune, I, I, I tend to write um, sort of more in like a, a, a fiddle style or Americana style uh, just uh, for one reason, just because of the, the groups that I, I'm, I'm playing in right now, that's kind of the music that we're playing. And so um, to some extent, it was just, okay, I, I had this initial melody. Um, and then the great thing about playing a string instrument is that we can accompany ourselves. We can, you know, we have these dr drones or open strings that we can kind of put under our melody as long as we're in the right key um, and kind of, you know, make it a more kind of full sounding composition. Um, and so that was, that was basically that, that, uh, that tune was, was trying to figure out, you know, where, where on the bass can I play this melody to the, you know, get the maximum kind of accompaniment, uh, uh, you know, and still kind of have it playable and still have it, you know, not, not ridiculously, challenging um so um yeah that's that was kind of the, the thought process behind that piece yeah it's it's a wonderful introduction to that sort of americana roots sort of writing but something that is is so much more approachable than what you might like i i love your playing craig and and i i wish i could do one one hundredth of what you can do on the bass but it's so cool to see something that is like that 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 gets that style across but is approachable and bringing back the same themes and and with some variations and it's just really cool and 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 the donovan uh wrote this this super fun piece called in sorcerer that's a perpetual motion piece it sort of starts from starts from nowhere comes out five eight got Ponticello, the heavy metal here it comes boom we're doing it and 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 then it and then it builds uh, this harmonic section goes back and it's like two i think we were texting about this you said it's only two and a half minutes but it might seem longer than that <laughs> yeah i thought that was the most hilarious thing i heard all day when i heard you say that <laughs> um yeah so you know yeah you gave us um you know some parameters um, and that was helpful for me to figure out how to do things. Some of the earliest stuff I wrote for bass was, uh, you know, I, I used to teach at this uh, Texas Tech band and orchestra camp, and we'd have a bass ensemble, and there was no music back then, or very little. And so we would just sort of see who was there and what they could do, and after the auditions, I would write something. And so it was really helpful. You had, like, a, a range and some ideas on you know, the, the Raboth positions or whatever. And so, uh, what I wanted to do with the left hand was, uh, not make it too difficult, uh, in terms of like a lot of speedy, you know, runs and arpeggios and that sort of thing. But I wanted to work on getting around the break, right? Um, so like getting into thumb position and then a little bit of semi-chromatic thumb position, but a little bit of stretch and those harmonics that you talked about, like near, near the end, it was like, well, that's the easiest way to like get that stretch and not have to worry about being in tune necessarily. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and then I wanted to do, I didn't want it just to be a left-hand thing. So I thought about like, what do I want to do with the bow? And, uh, I thought, you know, double stops could be more prevalent for people who are working at uh, at that level. Uh, not a lot of pieces are, are working those. And I help with those seven sort of planes that the bow goes in. They can mess with that a little bit. It also frees me up to have some harmonic stuff going on <laughs> as well. Because uh, I, I went the double stop uh, route rather than the harmonic route, uh, use of harmonics route. Um, and then 
I just like I thought, well, if we're writing pieces for I, I think it's intermediate to advanced, right? It's like people who are just coming in. Uh, I kind I played a lot of instruments growing up. And one of the things I did is I played in band, right? And I played in trombone in the band. And I noticed immediately when I started orchestra, which was really late. It was like a junior in high school um, that like the people in my orchestra program who were great players and the orchestra was good. We're not so slick with like five, eight, seven, eight, 11, 16, but like when you play in the band, there's, there's no Vivaldi written for concert band. So, um, I just thought, well, let's introduce that a little bit. And I, I, that gave a little bit of uh, bow work as well, because sometimes it's slurred three and two, and you've got to work through that. So those were sort of the pedagogical things that I was thinking of. And, uh, you know, as far as like the actual parts of the piece, so like that tapping on the side of the bass, like I'm just, uh, that's probably a me thing. Like I can't be still, and my fingers are always going. And if I'm in the car, I'm tapping on stuff all the time. And I thought, well, okay, well, this will also help them get that 5 8 in there before beforehand um and then yeah i just sort of built an arc uh and that's kind of how i put that together so uh yeah i was thinking the thing is uh i was thinking uh more gypsy than metal but i guess it came out more metal than gypsy so <laughs> i just i just I, I, went, I went there yeah but it's, it's actually been i've taught it to a couple of my students and it's actually i found it to be a a, a pretty easy piece to teach it sounds awesome so that's one thing and then uh and then the fact that you you get that five eight groove going and then you just uh you you understand and learn these chunks and i and once the student realized oh once i get through the the halfway through the second page i've got the piece it's down it's just now like like taking the taking the pieces and the and the components and putting it back together so it's been it's been a lot of fun to uh to work on in my end and to teach on my end and i can't wait to hear more people learn it. and then we had two people that couldn't join us so i'll just real quick uh, uh valentina chardelli uh wonderful bassist uh writing she, i think she goes by zappa woman so she's very uh very into frank zappa but all sorts of styles she wrote a piece called bricks number one and I just love how everybody took a slightly different approach. She was the only person who wrote for bass and piano. So we recorded that in Nashville. Really cool piece. A little bit of Hindemith in there and then a little maybe Zappa and then definitely a lot of Valentina in there. Really fun piece to play. I recorded it with this wonderful pianist named Megan uh, who is uh, 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 the wife of a bass player. So there's a lot of bass, you know, a lot of bass in this, in this project. And then Andres Martin wrote a great piece called Temple for solo bass and he took a different approach he wrote it, it, it he wrote two versions he wrote one that's all in first position so that's like in some ways that was the easiest of all of all the pieces is like G major first position um, and then he wrote a second version in thumb position that added in some double stops and a few other things and both of those can be combined as a duet so Andres and I actually played it at the NAM show in J last January we did we tested it out of course we couldn't even hear each other because that show's so noisy but um i look forward to actually playing it with a uh, with andres or whoever and i look forward to playing uh, all of your pieces uh, yeah, as things open up and i got a chance to play a few of them uh, for the raboth institute los angeles salita de jesus's event in june and yeah look at looking forward to seeing what else you all do and it's just been great to uh, continue to work with some of you and meet some of you for the first time. Uh, I'll make sure to link up to your respective websites, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, anything else anybody wants to get out there on this podcast? I just think this was such a fabulous project, the whole idea of it. Uh, and, you know, beyond just uh, my pleasure at being able to see and hear and talk to a bunch of people who are composing for bass, just the whole idea that you're going to uh, create a course that incorporates new music like this. I just, I, I just thought it was fabulous. Well, I, I am, I am so, I, I'm so pleased that you all got on board with this. And then I, I just from a someone who's taught bass for a long time, I, if I don't teach the Marcello E minor sonata again in my life, if I don't teach the first movement of Eccles or the Capuzzi Concerto, you know, I'll probably be good. I probably had my fill of that to, to to work on something new, something, and then someone that you can you could reach out to, you can watch them play 
play, you can hear their other compositions, you can follow along with them, you can work on something that's in your ability level, you know, like like the intent of this project. I just it's it was Jeff's idea. We were brainstorming a couple of years ago on this, and he said, How what if we did some commissions? And then as we talked about it, we thought, oh yeah, that ended up being the coolest part of this whole experience. So thank you all for uh your uh your great pieces and thanks for carving out some time. I can't believe we got a uh, a majority of people from all these different time zones on a, on a call together. I really appreciate it. So first of all, I had a blast playing your piece, uh, Bricks Number One, and the pianist and I had such a fun time. Her name is, was Megan, is Megan, and her husband is actually a bass player and a longtime friend of mine. And she's the pianist for the Nashville Symphony and and uh, teaches at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. And it was just so fun. And we were thinking like influences and i know of course you know your youtube handle is zappa woman i always think there has to be a little bit of zappa and something i was also getting some hindemith and then you of course have your own language all your own so um thank you for writing that and it was the only commission that we did that was bass and piano and i think it's so great to have in that course something for bass and piano because that's like our our natural companion so thank you for writing the piece and just tell tell me or tell us a little bit about the the thought process behind it yeah so first of all thank you so much for asking asking me for the writing and composing a piece for this course and uh, yeah i i just thought uh, that it was nice to put uh, the piano uh together with the bass but not as an accompaniment but just like a chamber duo as you can see i mean as you uh, might uh, analyze the piece as just like a chamber duet if it if it's like the um, the level is not that virtuoso of course as you required but i i keep would like to maintain this uh sense of chamber music because sometimes the piano um the pianist is misunderstood it's like a tool you know we have to play on piano and but the 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 brightest part is on the bass not the shiny part but this is not true even if you see on Bottesini composition especially i don't know for example the grand allegro i've just like recently recorded uh, you can see how much important is to understand the piano part uh, because it's part of the the solo i mean you're not alone no and i've heard version where the piano part are completely cut out and this is just make no sense to me in a musical way because it's not uh, about the bass it's about the music so that's why i decide to put uh, the piano part in this piece and actually you can play in a two in two different way no because there is the solo version that the the bass part doesn't change at all uh and uh, you can put the piano on it and it's changed the meaning of the harmony and the piece but your part is exactly the same and it's also nice because i um i've seen this way of composing uh, a matter of context no you can say whatever you want. It's just the context that changed the meaning of the things you're doing. So, uh, and it, the music, it's so nice because you can play on these kind of things, no? The same melody can sound like in a mod modal way or in a tonal way or whatever. It, it depends which what you're playing this melody so this is actually the the meaning of this piece not the context basically and it's also nice because you you can practice the, the piece by itself and it's already complete but then if you have a, a concert or a recital with pianists you can just put the piano on it because it makes sense too it, it is so fun. It's so cool that you can do it by yourself, but then also with the piano. And you have this, you have all these great you know, harmonic sections, pizzicato sections. You have these left-hand pizzicatos that add some flair to it. And, and you wrote it in this sort of modular way. So it makes it really easy to find the different chunks and practice it i think it makes it, it it makes it really approachable and it's just really fun uh writing yeah the the thing is like um the way i compose i mean not only for bass is very in a modular way i i really like patterns <laughs> and just start from patterns and just flourish them uh i mean a lot of uh, established composer from the past did it like first of all one of the most famous maybe 
Beethoven, <laughs> if anyone knows this name, but I mean, it's just like, uh, and I, I really like this kind of composers. I mean, Frank Zappa did the same too, you know, just like Stravinsky, come on. All the, I think all the composer I'm most obsessed with, they, they are just like this kind of modular composer that they really like the patterns and they compose on that. So this is probably why I just like, kept it in in my technique no it's, it's like when you play an instrument and you like a, like the way of playing off your teacher or another teacher and you not copy but you just make it yours no mm -hmm. so this is the same with composition and um i think the most important thing that's always fascinated me it's rhythm uh, I really like just the, the kind of the rhythmical patterns, mostly more than the melody, actually. Melody came second. First is the rhythm and the tempo. I don't know, it's the beat and then the melody comes. Uh, I don't know, it's just, this is my way of um, composing and also the thing I'm searching in the music I play. Yeah, and it's got it's. I love the rhythmic playfulness of this. Bumpada, bumpada, da da. And it was it was so fun. I went through. I put the metronome on the eighth note, and I practiced all of it the first time I pulled it out. And then I just as I got it, it's got this great flow to it. It's just really, really fun to play, and it was really fun to record this. I'll just share my personal story. So, so Jeff Chalmers came over to Nashville, Tennessee, to and we we filmed, and so I came in for a day and filmed filmed a little bit of extra. Uh, you know, we're just finishing up this course, and it he it was at this Nashville is a re big recording hub for all kinds of music, but especially like bluegrass and country western music and that sort of thing. So this studio okay. was this really quirky place, and they had a piano. And folks who watched the video of of this, uh, it, it's I, I I love your piece and all the pieces of this course, but this is the only one with the piano, so this is the only time you'll see this, but. They had this piano that just has to be seen to be believed. It was uh, a, a player piano from I don't even know when that was like all broken and it would look crazy. And then I knew Megan, you know, she's like a classical pianist coming from the Nashville Symphony. Would she like, <laughs> what would she think of this like not Steinway piano? Like the piano was set up well as a good piano, but it was like the sort of thing that would be perfect in like a, a bluegrass music <laughs> yeah. or something. And she comes comes into the recording studio and she looks and she just starts laughing. She thought it was awesome. And then she's like, we have to get photos of us with the piano. So I don't know if this has popped up on social media yet, but there's some of like me and Megan after we got done recording your piece um, <laughs> in the background. And she had a, she had so much fun uh, playing it and I had so much fun and it was so cool to come in and record it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. And this is the, the, the first target of uh, the music I write that the players enjoy the the music because as as a player as a performer the most horrible thing is when you have to play music that you don't like that much it's uh, like especially work a lot with some I mean with contemporary composer like student or just advanced or professional and sometimes uh, the the thing is like composers nowadays are not performer anymore and they just write without thinking on the kind of physical attitude you need on stage mm -hmm. um so the the thing is also you have when you write you have to think about what you think it's good what it looks good on the score but also what is feel good on stage um because i I think it's so important to also give some freedom of interpretation and also mm, the joy to the player that it's make your music real. Uh, this is just uh, your score is on the on the paper, no leaveless, and you have to give to somebody else. And I mean yourself if you're the player or other people. But if there are other people, it's some much more big responsibility because you have to give something that they enjoy i'm not i'm not talking about happy music huh? i just like mm, telling some music that makes sense in a performing way even if it's something very strange very odd very new but it has to make sense for the player i think yeah
and and your uh, your music it always has t- uh, elements of of playfulness or interest or all sorts of yeah, this is just filled with character and and this and this piece is, is no exception it is just absolutely fun to play and it was really cool to see how you tackled this challenge we had which is write something with a player who's g- developing but they're not a virtuoso yet and I think you just wrote that so so well and it's it's so much fun and it's the sort of thing that I know I'm going to be working on with students for years to come so uh, I, love, I love everything you do, Valentina. You're the best. And I thank you for being a part of this. And I, I can't wait to see what your next project's going to be. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, there are a lot of projects actually coming on. Uh, but really, thank you so much for, for this opportunity. And really hope, uh, I, I'm really happy you enjoyed it. And uh, also your student, I hope they will enjoy it. And all the people who will just like apply for the the um, the course on uh, on internet i really hope that people will just enjoy to play my piece and also the other wonderful piece i've heard uh, uh, of the other colleagues really brilliant uh, project <laughs>